Hello, geniuses. Welcome back to For the Record. I'm your host, Rob Markman. Now, today's episode is an important and a serious one. We'll be talking to Drew Dixon, a music industry veteran whose story is central to a new HBO Max documentary called On the Record. And this is where she details her experience in the business and her account of rape and sexual misconduct at the hand of Def Jam Records founder, Russell Simmons. An allegation which Simmons has denied just want to say that up front, but today she is here to speak to us about her experience, and we're just going to go through it all. Drew Dixon, welcome to For the Record. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I watched On the Record, right? And, and I just want to start here because as a hip-hop fan and as somebody who really studies and values the history of hip-hop, I, I was the kid who read all the credits. You know, um, I was a little ashamed that I didn't know your name. I'm familiar with your work. But as an A&R executive at Def Jam, you worked on records like Met the Man and Mary, I'll Be There For You, the show soundtrack. Throughout your career, you've done records with Lauryn Hill, Q-Tip, Brandy, Monica. Like, the list goes, like, when you see the list, it, it, I, I, I could just talk to you about music for an hour because it's so fascinating, the stuff that you worked on. Um, talk to me about, I, I guess let's start with Meth and Mary. I'll Be There For You, right? Like... Huge record. Like, how does a record like that even come together? Because I remember hearing the original version on Method Man's To Cal album, and it sounded nothing like the version that we all know and love now, right? How does that even come together? Bring the Pain was out. You know, it was already clearly like a banger. And it was pretty much, I was really just supposed to sort of like land the plane, dot the I's, cross the T's. And there was this interlude where Method Man said, Shorty, I'm there for you. Anytime you need me for your growth, me in your world, believe me, that makes me feel better than a woman. Ba 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 ba. And I was like, oh my God. Like, this is like so loving and so vulnerable, but it's also like so hip hop. So I went to Russell and I played him the interlude and I said, this can't just be an interlude. We need to make it a duet. And I suggested that we reach out to Mary J. And so we said, that's cool. Call Puffy. And then basically Puffy said yes. And then it was like kind of crazy because after Puffy started working on it, we found out that RZA needed to approve it. And RZA said, that's a great idea. I'll do it. And so then actually there were two remixes happening at the same time because RZA didn't know Puffy had already started. So I would actually have to run back and forth between the hit factory where Puffy was working, take the reels to Chung King where RZA was working, make sure the reels were rewound to the top at the beginning of every RZA session so he didn't know Puffy was working until eventually we finally told him, okay, so there's this other version and so that's why there's two versions, and that's actually why the video is shot to Riz's version. But yeah, so this was literally just, I had an idea from the interlude as a woman who loved hip hop, who was touched by the interlude and felt it should be a song. That's amazing. And uh, as I remember it, Meth had always said he didn't like the record at the beginning. Like they had to convince him to do it. Were, were, were you part of... Because just to paint the picture, right? You, you look at that record now and it is really a modern day version of Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell. Like it really is for a generation, that song that brings a man and a woman together, right? Um, Hip hop was very different. Like I, I think if you look at Enter the Wu-Tang, there were no women in any of the videos. Like there, were, there was... Meth, as much as he's a heartthrob and considered now when women love Method Man... He was rough, rugged, and raw. Like, <laughs> Which is why I was so moved when I heard the interlude, because it was not what I would have expected from him. And it was definitely not the direction that he was going overall. But I just thought it was important for us to have, like, a sort of a counterpoint as, like, another side of what a hip-hop head could be or could say, like, you know, there's different aspects to everybody's life, including Method Man's life, including a rapper, you know, and his girl. And why can't we show that too? So yeah, I, it was definitely not an easy sell. But, you know, I remember when we finished the Puffy version, we were at the Hit Factory and it was late. And for some reason, Biggie was there, Mary was there. 
I don't think Meth was there, Puffy was there, and we danced to like a 20 minute version of the record, just like on a loop, because we just loved it. We were like, oh my God, we stepped in it. We stepped in it this time. So yeah, it's um it was definitely a labor of love. Thank you for that. Such a such a classic record. I, I can't imagine. I mean, it was just a defining record even for me and 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 my relationships growing up. It, like it was just a present. That and, and, and Biggie's One More Chance remix were kind of like, you know, if you're talking about the summer of ninety five, like those were the records that you fell in love to. Um and you originally didn't get credit on, on the record? Is is that true? I did not get credit. I worked really hard to make it. I I worked, you know, I convinced Russell to let me try it. And and I was super grateful that he gave me the room to do that. And then obviously Puffy and Rizza and Mary and Meth came through with the fire. It never occurred to me that like it wasn't a given that it would be like my AR credit, because it was my idea until I like, you know, turned the CD over and like I wasn't anywhere on it. Which is why when Russell gave me the show soundtrack to work on, I typed the credits myself. And I actually just typed co-executive producers. I actually first wrote executive producers, Drew Dixon and Russell Simmons. And I was like, that may be, I mean, I, I put the whole thing together, but I was like, well, he might be mad about that. So then I made it executive producers, Drew Dixon and Russell Simmons. And I was like, okay, co-executive producers, Russell Simmons and Drew Dixon. And like, nobody said anything. And that's why I got the credit. But I actually typed it for the show soundtrack because I realized if I didn't personally make sure I got the credit, I wouldn't get the credit on this next record either. And it was your idea to bring Mary to pair Mary and Meth. Like that that came from you. The, the reality is the first person I suggested was Lauren Hill because I was friends with Lauren. And but this is before the score. So she was not like big yet. So I mentioned Lauren to Russell and he was like, Lauren Hill? Like, who's that? And then I called Puffy. And that's essentially, I sent Puffy, like, I think I had like a messenger send him, you know, actually, no, I don't, whatever, the the interlude. And um, and then he called, he's like, Drew, I think this is dope. And I, it's, in, on, it's in the documentary on the record where he like had the Tammy Terrell idea and asked me to sing it. And he like did the children's story beat. You know, and that's essentially how how it went from me calling Puffy to ask if Mary would do it and if he could help to him saying, not only do I think Mary should do it, I'll produce it. Is it fair to say, and just looking at your, your resume, right, and looking at the records that you've been, and, and this is just me speculating, looking at the credits, I feel like your superpower is the duets, is bringing people together, right? Because, okay, we're talking about Meth and Mary, that's a classic for the culture, right? You also met the man, a red man on How High, so, which was yeah, on the Soul soundtrack. That was yeah, that was um, the single for the show soundtrack. You know, I have to say that was a collaborative sort of idea that was, you know, as we were talking, I, I walked into Lior Cohen's office with a stack of cassettes that I'd collected for the show soundtrack, and. He like actually hated me for a long time just because he misunderstood my relationship with Russell and ultimately listened to these tapes and was like, wow, this is dope. We need a single. And so then we kind of had a brainstorm between me, Lior, Julie Greenwald, and came up with the idea of the Method Man, Red Man duet idea. So that was actually a group sort of brainchild you know, that really Julie and Lior made happen. I didn't have the juice to get like Method Man and Red Man to do it, but we all kind of discussed it and and that's how it came to be the single on the show soundtrack. Yeah, because th- those two guys, I remember the Month of the Man campaign, they dropped albums in, in the same um, month on Def Jam. They were two priority artists for Def Jam. I mean, you know, when I just look at your, your, your again, the um, records that you worked on, Brandy and Monica, The Boy Is Mine, Classic Duet, Lauren Hill and D'Angelo, Nothing Really Matters. And the actual Lauren and Mary J duet, um, the um, uh, I Used to Love Him, there's a line in that song that I wrote, which is, he was the ocean and, and I was the sand, was from a poem that I'd written that Lauren had used in a duet that's actually on YouTube called The Perfect Match with my artist Kylie Ranks, that she took from that poem that I'd written 
and that duet and then ended up on the Mary Lauren duet. So it's funny. I hadn't thought of that, but there's also the Deborah Cox RL duet. We can't be friends, which I found. And then Estelle and Kanye. It was my idea to call Kanye to get him on that record for American boy. So you're right. I think I do have like a weird duet thing happening. <laughs> That's dope. And I got to say, I got to tip my hat to you. One of my top five favorite Mary records of all time is every day it rains. Also on the show, show soundtrack. It's amazing. I, I wanted to start here, right? Because listen, I watched on the record, I watched the documentary and I, I was heartbroken. Like it really just hurt to watch, um, to see what, what you and hear the accounts of you and, and the other women in the documentary of what they go to. I, I know working in the in music industry for me, working at Genius, being able to document this culture is my dream job. And um, of course, I think we all face ups and downs in our careers. I've faced ups and downs. Nothing like what you women faced. And trying to put myself in your shoes, I couldn't imagine the point where my dream job then becomes a nightmare. You, you know? And I, I guess that that's maybe my next question to you is, is at what point is it a dream? Because yo, even just watching you smile and light up talking about these records and going back to making these records that I, I just see this light like at what point does does the dream become a nightmare for you when do you start realizing that maybe the, the music industry is is not a safe place for you so you know i came up with this saying after def jam the record business is no place for someone who loves music um you know and i don't know if i even was fully internalizing the assault when I said that. I'd worked so hard to get that job. I answered phones at three different companies before I got that job. I interned at Jive Records. I was an intern at Warner Brothers Records. I was a receptionist at Empire Artist Management, where I worked with Primo and J. Rue. And I finally got the job making rap records, reporting to my idol. And so I almost made up my mind that literally no matter what happened, I was just going to keep going. I was just going to sort of, if I didn't internalize it, then it was like almost not real. My vision was, let me just survive long enough to have one more hit with my name on the back. And then I can take this and instead of leaving Def Jam with an excuse, I'm leaving Def Jam with proof that I can do the thing that I said I can do, that I love to do. And that's why it's so devastating that it was like just at that moment that the assault happened. Because I had finally gotten the thing I needed to go to the next company where I thought I'd be safe. And then the assault happened. So I actually was going to quit the business then. You know, I was, you know, I was done. I was out. You know, I didn't leave my apartment for like a month. Maybe like I, I went and told my mentor, you know. And and Miguel Mojica, who's in the in the documentary, was his intern, which is why he was there that day. But other than that, I pretty much that was it. Like, you know, I cut off all my hair, like I was done. And and then I honestly just frankly started running out of money. I had rent to pay in New York City, I had bills to pay, I had a student loan I was still paying, and I had this number one record. And so major labels started to call me when they found it. I was sort of I quit my job. And I like literally took these meetings like with this long, sour face, like, you know, I I was over it. And then actually Clive broke through because he's a music man. And Clive actually would joke, you know, when I worked with him that if I was in an argument with him about, I don't know, like the Q-tip album or a single or whatever, you know, just like, you know, a debate about work stuff. He would say, it's really easy. If Drew's mad at me, I just play a record that I have the only copy of that she loves. And in like, by the first chorus, it's all good. And we can like move on and have our conversation. And so Clive and I just connected around music. And that's why I decided to sort of stick my toe back in the water. And I kind of was able to, in some ways, hide behind his power which is interesting now I think about that too. Like he's this white man, you know, and now I, I realize I didn't know then he's come out of a closet. He was gay. So like, it was like the safest possible place for me to be. 
and I had my best run there. You know, I, I worked with him and I was able to facilitate so many amazing records there that I started to get my confidence back, which is why when he left to start J Records, I decided instead of signing a five-year contract with him, I'll just run out my contract with L.A. Reid and I was going to start my own label. You know, I even set it up and everything. And anyway. Um, so this was at this was at Arista with, with, when Clive was at Arista. Yeah. And he went on and, and when he started J, I think Alicia Keys was like the first big act that that really put J Records on the map. Obviously, Clive was already Clive Davis. And L.A. Reid L.A. Reid was for, brought in to replace Clive. I was going to go with Clive. Clive had a list. I don't know if you saw A Devil Wears Prada, but he had like a list, like the Miranda Priestly list of all the artists and executives that were going with him. And I was on his list, like happily. I loved him. He was my, you know, mentor. And then we actually got in an argument about Q-Tip because I felt like he wasn't focusing on the Breathe and Stop single. Vibrant thing had sort of gotten scooped by the Violator sample. And so we didn't really have our own single to drive his solo album project. And Breathe and Stop was doing really well at radio, but Clive was totally distracted focusing on Jay Records. You know, L.A. Reid didn't care about the Q-Tip record either because he wasn't there yet. So like my record was getting lost you know, and I was just furious and Clive and I were getting into arguments and I wasn't even able to be like not mad when he played a record I liked. I was like really mad. And that's when I finally said, well, maybe I should take LA's call. And that's when I took his call and he basically said, you know, why don't you just ride it out here for 18 months? And I'd known him for the whole time I'd been in the industry. I'd met him really early when I was at Zamba before Def Jam, I crashed Outcast's first mastering session because I'd heard their sampler tape. And that's how I met L.A. Reid. And he'd always been respectful of me. So I had no reason to believe that would be problematic. And then as soon as I kind of cut the cord with Clive, L.A. Reid just changed it up. And he wanted to change the dynamic of our relationship. And that's when I just sort of crumbled, you know, completely. I, w- I want to go back a little bit, though, be- and, and this will lead us right back into um, the L.A. Reid part of your story. Um, just for, for the fans who know, those who aren't aware, in December 2017, you accused Russell Simmons of rape um, and detailing your account with the New York Times. Um, the alleged incident happened in 1995. This is at the point when the show is is on the charts, like number one. It was the number one R&B album in the country. It was the number four pop album in the country. I thought I was, I, I thought I was clean. I was like, I'm safe. Why would he, you know, compromise, you know, the relationship he has with me professionally, given now the fact that I've proven myself a second time, you know, and now it's not just a single, it's not just a remix. It's an entire album. I just really thought, I don't know. I wanted him to see me as like a, an apprentice, like a protege who was like, you know, rising to the top of my game. And that's just not how he saw me. And and, and the value in your work and, and not, and not, not the value being your body or, 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 or your sexuality. Um, the, the part that I think is really, it's all important, but and you touched on it, but the patterns of behavior and advances that you had to fight off prior to this night where where he asked you up to your apartment to listen to a demo. Why? Because everybody knows that, you know, if you want to get in, in Drew's good graces, play her an amazing song that she's never heard, right? Like, even when you say that about, it's like, oh, and, and, and we just know, you know, the predatory nature is very pick up on, on things, right? That we may not even pick up on in ourselves. As a woman, and, and this is the part that I want people to hear and understand. This is the part where I want to listen for myself, because part of this is me talking because I'm the host of the show. A major part of this is listening. And especially being in the music industry, what the hell are you going through? Because at the same time, when your job is hard and you're, and you're finding the, 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 the strength to do your job, 
while at the same time you're fighting off these sexual advances, these comments in the office, these little hand grabs, this and that. It's almost like you had two jobs. And 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 I don't know, as a man, I can't it's hard enough focusing on my job without focusing on the other thing of having to fight off somebody's advances and deal with somebody's sexual ego. Um, how did you find the space to 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 do that? You know, I think I'm only now starting to realize the toll that it took on me. You know, it just wore me down. It eroded my self-confidence. I think I made bad personal relationship choices during that time because it was so demoralizing and it made me feel worthless. But at the same time, I was laser focused on the goal of making hit rap records because I'd come to New York City to do that. I'd answered phones. I finally had my shot. And nobody wants to hear an excuse. You know, you, you know, I played basketball when I was in high school. I was a rebounder. You know, you just come up with the rebound. Nobody wants to hear why you didn't come up with the rebound. You just come up with the rebound. And I wasn't a great outside shooter, but I would get every rebound. Like I crashed the boards and I could do them chip shots. You know, those go up and down until you get it. And I was like in a zone professionally and I was determined to like come up with two points no matter what. And so while I was focusing on that, I think I shut down the emotional trauma of what he was doing. And I think I lost track of how far away from like what was the first infraction And I don't think I realized how bruised up I was getting and how scratched up I was getting and how beaten down I was emotionally. So, you know, I don't think I understood how much trauma I brought with me to Arista. I didn't get therapy really until it was all over, until I totally left the industry. I mean, it also speaks to your tremendous strength, uh, tenacity, which, which you shouldn't have had to put on display in that way. But to be able, again, to really do your job at a high level while simultaneously focusing on protecting yourself is is something that should have never been asked of you to do. I want to ask this question because so often we think of justice in a very romanticized way, right? Like you do a crime, you get brought up on charges, you go to trial, you're guilty or innocent. In sexual assault and rape cases, it's almost never this cut and dry. Right. Um, you haven't brought Russell up on any criminal charges, correct? No. I So I, I sued Russell for sexual harassment in 1997. I guess 96 and it was settled in 97. I actually only did that. It's in the film, I think, as well. Because they opened an Amex card for me to use for business expenses using my social security number at Def Jam. And then my last expense account, they just never paid the last sort of one that I submitted. And so I basically sued in order to get him to pay the Amex bill and my lawyer. So I settled for about $28,000. My lawyer was $25,000. The bill was $3,000. And I didn't even round up to like the nearest dollar. I didn't want a penny. But as a result of that, he did sign something acknowledging having harassed me. My lawyer at the time wanted me to go after him for the rape. I didn't want to do that because I didn't want it to become this big thing that became a news story. And then I would be famous for being the woman that, you know, was raped by Russell Simmons. I, I just didn't want that. I just wanted my bill paid, the lawyer paid, and I wanted to go on with my life. I was already at Arista. I was already doing well there. And I didn't want this to like turn my life upside down, you know? Um, And then the statute of limitations on rape is seven years in New York. It used to be seven years. Now it's unlimited. I didn't understand until I actually spoke at the New York Times and met with a NYPD, like special victims person that what happened to me is first degree forcible rape. So now that is unlimited in New York, but at the time it was seven years. So I don't even have the option, you know, to pursue Russell in the criminal justice system. I also have real issues with the criminal justice system as a black woman in America. I think it's really problematic that a lot of 
actually black men I see on social media criticize the Russell Simmons survivors for not going to the police. And I'm like, wait, the same police who kill black people, the same criminal justice system that's racist. Now, all of a sudden, that's your arbiter of our truthfulness. Like, the truth is, if a Black woman calls the police when a Black man rapes her, she might be getting him killed, herself killed. Like, we already know how they act. So, like, why would we in any way, like, want to invoke the police or the criminal justice system as Black women? Like, what kind of justice is that ever for us, like, historically and even today? So, I don't know. I just think... I, I think the statute of limitations for rape should be extended because the first thing you need to do as a survivor is heal. And that takes a really long time. You need to get your life back together to be in any position to interact with the criminal justice system. And then clearly the criminal justice system itself is problematic, is racist structurally. And that's a whole separate conversation. So I don't know how to think about justice I think more about healing and I think more about the next generation of mm. women and men. And, you know, I hope that we can respond to this story in a way that gives them some confidence that they matter and that we're going to choose survivors over abusers, no matter how famous and powerful the abusers are. Because if we don't, I think it's going to have a chilling effect. And I think a whole new generation of women in the music industry are going to remain silent and broken and traumatized and exiled. You just answered like three or four of my follow-up questions in one, which is amazing. I, I, I love it. And, and, and I, I agree with you um, wholeheartedly, unfortunately, you know, and, and my reasoning and, and our reasoning um. Rahel, who who is our producer here, when we talked about doing the show, uh, you know, part of it is, I, I mean, there, there's nothing that I could I could do personally or that we could do personally that changed what happened to you. Um, I think the conversation that we have to make it so that it doesn't happen to women again, and and the responsibility is really on 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 the men. Um, women ha- haven't created this environment in the workplace. It's really for men to step up and change and 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 create an environment where women feel safe or any underrepresented group feels safe. Um when you talk about your time working with LA Reed, right? You talk about the penalties you face for turning down his advances. Um, particularly you try to sign Kanye West, you try to sign John Legend and weren't able to get those deals done because you didn't come to a hotel room meeting, uh, because you didn't give in to maybe patterns of behavior that you were familiar with being at Def Jam. Like you, you, you almost saw the signs and, and, and where things could lead. I, I, I want to ask you, how do, how do you know, right? And did you ever question yourself like the truth is right like there were a lot of labels who didn't see the potential in Kanye early capital famously turned down the deal even Jay-Z himself didn't see the potential in Kanye as an artist at Rockefeller originally right so how were you able to grapple with something like a LA Reed turning down a Kanye West and at what point does it become clear that this is to you a retaliatory decision rather than maybe a business decision or or him seeing something or not seeing something that you saw. Right. So what happened with L.A. Reid in turning down Kanye and turning down John when I tried to sign them was part of a pattern that was already unfolding. So before he turned down John and Kanye, I signed an artist named Toya that he did let me sign in the beginning of our working relationship when it was still cool. Like, He was a little flirtatious, but it was still cool. Like, I knew him. I knew his wife. And I was able to redirect, redirect. He signed Toya. We made the album. He really loved it. We were in a staff meeting. This is when he started asking me to come 
to the Four Seasons where he was staying. He was just moving from Atlanta and was, I guess, like renovating a place or something. I don't know. And he'd started to ask me to come to the hotel after the studio. And I was just sort of blowing him off. I would stop answering his call after a certain time at night because I knew that he was going to ask. And he wanted me to come and listen to Toya's album. And there was a staff meeting the next day, this particular, you know, time that he asked me to come to the hotel to listen to her album. And Toya was printed at the top of the agenda for the whole staff. It was the senior staff. She was testing really well. It was the number one, I Do, her single was the number one Churban record, which was then contemporary hit Urban record, in the country, nationally, testing through the roof. And the promotions department was talking about it. They were excited. And he interrupted them. Ellie Reed interrupted them. And he looked down the table at me. And he said, I want everyone to take a pen out and draw a line through Toya's name. We're not going to chase that record. And the promotions people were like, no, 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 but it's testing. And he was like, and then he looked right at me. He said, I listened to her album in my hotel room last night. And I don't like it anymore. We're not going after that record. So, I mean, that was like very clear, right? That was as clear as day. I was supposed to come listen to the album. I didn't. He crossed it off. He looked at me and he said that he listened to it alone in his hotel room. And he didn't like it anymore. Then I brought in Kanye. And when I brought in Kanye, he didn't just pass on Kanye. While Kanye was in the waiting area, he then lectured me in front of the whole A&R department about how it was so far, it was a waste of his time. It was embarrassing. You are an embarrassment. You are a joke. Like it wasn't just a pass, it was you are a joke. And then I finally was like, okay, can I just go tell him because he's waiting? And then it was John. You know, and then in between, we would kind of go back and forth on this seesaw of, you know, like he would be flirtatious and I would laugh or he would say he liked my hair and he would like play with it and I would laugh, you know, and then we would kind of get back to a better place. And then he would say, okay, I'll come to the John audition. And then it was come to my hotel and then I wouldn't, and then he wouldn't show up. So it was like this, you know, so I can't prove it, but it's kind of like, you know, as a black person, when you tell somebody, okay, this is racism and your white friends are like, well, you're like, mm, trust me, I know. And they don't know because they don't live it. You know, who can ever prove it, right? You know, and then he told me he wanted me to start wearing skirts and heels every day. So I started wearing jeans and Birkenstock clogs, which I knew he hated. I mean, I wore the clogs, like literally, like, you know, and then I like kept my heels under my desk for going out at night after. I like was like, I'm not wearing them anywhere around him. I'm not even giving him any reason to think that's what this is about, you know, but it didn't matter. At, at this point, and the reason I bring it up, because oftentimes uh, abusers, predators could be very manipulative and start making you question yourself, you know, um, and oh, is Kanye that good? Maybe I'm losing it. Is John Legend that good? But it seems like in this case... You you were very clear. You knew what the talent was, and you were very clear at this what was happening by this point. So it's hard to say. I knew how to not end up alone with him where I might be assaulted. And I'm not suggesting for one second that Ellie Reed is violent or was ever violent with me or was ever violent with anyone. I don't have any reason to speculate that at all. But given my experience, Russell was never violent with me either. And so I knew better than to come upstairs to listen to a demo or an album or anything. I knew that. So I thought I was wiser at 29 than I'd been at 24. But now that I look back at it, there were other things where I was manipulated and confused in, in the sense that, you know, like just the way in which I, I felt like I could buy time to kind of get my label set up and to, I signed Alice Smith, I auditioned Alice Smith for LA and he passed. And so I signed her to my label and I was just like, I just need you to wait until my deal at Aris is done. And then when I left, I just ripped up the contract and let her go and she signed to Sony. But I still naively believed there was a way that I could sort of like walk this tightrope between 
getting stuck alone in a room with him, but also like not pissing him off so that I could still do my job. And now I realize that all of that was just unhealthy and all of that was a trap and there was no way to win. And, you know, I don't know what the alternative was because I think the industry was toxic and these gatekeepers, like I kind of made it to a certain point and whenever I would get to the top, I got stopped by like, you know, some man in a position of power who kind of wanted me to like pay the toll to go to the next level. And so, you know, I don't know. I, I, I thought I was smarter at 29 than I was at 24 and I didn't get raped and the second time, but that's also what cost me my career. You know, the harassment cost me my career. I, I saved my career. I, I, I got back up off the ground after the rape and had a five year run where I was able to facilitate my love is your love for Whitney, Maria, Maria for Carlos. I introduced Matt Salerdic, the producer that made smooth to Clive, you know, I, you know, a rose is still a rose. I could go on and on. Like, you know, a nobody's supposed to be here for Deborah Cox. Q-tip. The brand new being album. I bought that album the first day it came out. Did? Foundation. Are Don't you let it go to your head. Serious? I love that single. I was a big fan of the Foundation record. Like, wow. Which which goes back to me from the beginning is my slight embarrassment of like when I start to read the credits, I'm like, these are all records that that I love that Drew has been involved in. And, you know, I just want you to know, and, and you know, but the impact that you made musically, the things that you worked on um, have really stuck with us and, and, and really like stood the test of time. And, you know, maybe brand new. And listen, I, I think you got to be like a real hip hop head to know that the foundation record, it didn't get all his flowers, but I remember it that got five moment. mics. Yeah. It, it was like 98, right? It came out around the same time. Jay, I remember Jay. Um, I think it was 98, maybe 99, life. something like that. Yeah. But it got like, five mics in the source and that yeah. meant everything. <laughs> right. You, you know, help bring us, bring us loom. Correct. You know, um, who who went on and didn't have the, the biggest career at, at Bad Boy. But when you think about his pen and him as a writer, even if you don't know his records, you know the I verses signed that Loon. he wrote. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Since since you came forward um, with your allegations and, and, and since the On the Record documentary, um, Russell has made some media appearances, The Breakfast Club, Drink Champs, both really popular shows um, in the culture. Um, you tweeted about The Breakfast Club interview. Um, what did you think about how you just saw media treating Russell in, in, in the midst of everything? And, and, and what do you think is the way to actually go about that? It's really painful, not just for me and the other Russell Simmons survivors personally. In the end, these Black women and girls in particular are just considered expendable, are considered not worth protecting. And, you know, even though I understand that she had other reasons and you know, she claims, you know, that she had creative differences with the film. And I take her at her word, the chilling effect of Oprah Winfrey joining this film, the documentary on the record, and then exiting. And then for Ava DuVernay, whose work we admire, who's a champion, not just an amazing filmmaker, but a champion and a sort of activist filmmaker, for her to then criticize the film you know, you pile all of this on and what scares me is that a whole nother generation of women and girls will be silent when they are confronted with harassment and abuse because no one will speak for us. And so I don't have a problem with Russell Simmons being given an opportunity to go on The Breakfast Club or title to speak if it's going to be a rigorous interview, but not a softball Uncle Russ tell us about how sad you must be that your best friend just died. I mean, I was fond of Andre Harrell. He was cool. I, I admire his work, and that is a huge loss. But 
how we're starting out an interview with somebody that's been credibly accused as a serial rapist of, of many women, many black women in the most important, arguably, radio show, nationally syndicated black radio show, certainly in hip hop. And the first question is, your best friend died, literally like he's seven. You know what I mean? Like, and, and, and like, not a grown man who's worth $350 million, who has an empire, who's been credibly accused of sexual misconduct by 20 women. You know, when I went to the New York Times, before I even went on the record, my second interview with them was like rigorous. They put a timeline together of my life. You know, they knew everything about when I'd finished school, when I'd put out the show soundtrack. They'd already contacted my friends from the 90s, some of whom I wasn't even tight with anymore because I'd grown apart. And these people told me the first 10 minutes of their phone calls with the New York Times consisted of, what kind of person is Drew Dixon? Is she a credible human being? Before they even asked them to corroborate the account of the rape. So I went through the ringer in terms of the way my story was vetted by the New York Times. I went through the ringer in terms of the way my story was vetted by Apple TV, by Harpo Productions, by the filmmakers. You know, and I subjected myself to that. I let them call people, you know, from ex-boyfriends that I told what had happened. I called somebody that I was dating the night it happened. You know, they went back to him, you know, and I exposed myself to that kind of rigorous, journalistic, investigative reporting because I wanted, you know, it to be very clear that this story is true and I understand the the implications of telling a story like this about a man who also has a reputation and he deserves to have my story vetted before it's printed, I accept that. But then when the tables are turned, the Breakfast Club let him go on and on and on for like 45 minutes, making all sorts of claims about me that aren't true, that they didn't push back on, claims about Jenny Lumet, claims about the other women, just throwing out all kinds of like, oh, when have you talked to this person or that. I mean, I don't even remember what he said, but he was just like dangling little things about each of us that were meant to break us apart, that were meant to make us seem sketchy without even really clarifying what he meant, without any pushback. There was no rigorous journalism. So if you're going to give the man an audience, hold him to the same high rigorous journalistic standards that we were held to. Salai had to go to two different organizations over the course of seven months before her story was even printed in The Hollywood Reporter. You know, I mean, we didn't just get to pick up the phone and go on and on and on and throw out accusations that could destroy a man's reputation without being fact-checked and having every stone turned over. So why did he get to do that? Why is he held to a much lower standard than we are? If the Breakfast Club is going to just let him rip us to shreds, sitting in like his little yoga pose as the sympathetic figure without any pushback, and then he gets to do it again on title, you know, who in our community is speaking out for us? Where's the Essence Magazine article about us? There's a People Magazine article about the Russell Simmons survivors? Where's the es- Essence Magazine article about the Russell Simmons survivors? Where are our champions? Who in our community is letting us hold forth? Who's holding space for us? And what message are we sending to survivors right now? As powerful, I mean, you've given me a lot to think about. I, I think um, as somebody in media, like constantly looking in the mirror and like, how can I be better? How can I do better on my job? How can I be fair? How can I be right? How can I be truthful um, and faithful to the audience? You know, um, so I think that was really powerful for for what you said. Um, what I mean, I, I guess the next step of this, right, is like, where do we go from here, Drew? Like, there's obviously things that you have been through that you will have to live with for the rest of your life, and 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 
and again, I, I say that re- regret, right? Um, but maybe these conversations, and to me, and maybe it's idealistic, but I, I, I really think with these conversations, um, you coming out and telling your stories and the other women and us having this conversation here could start to, to teach a new generation what is and what isn't okay. Um, particularly, obviously, when it, when it comes to women. Um, do you have advice for young women and young men? Because I, I'm very careful like to not put it on to the women. I don't think the women need to change. I think it's the men that need to change. Just it, advice for young women who want to be music execs and are, 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 are grappling with this, this toxic culture. Because I'm sure there's also some young women who are just finishing college and being like, and maybe who saw on the record and be like, you know what? I'm not going, I want to go to the music industry. I'm not going. We're scaring off some really talented people and rightfully so, because who wants to put their body on the line? We love it, but how much do you love it? It is not worth the price that you had to pay. I mean, I just would never want anyone not to pursue their dream from a place of fear. Even if the fear is warranted, I understood that I was taking on a misogynistic culture. I did not understand I was taking on rape culture. And so I would say my advice to any young woman in any industry, but especially music, you know, given the fact that, you know, that's where I have my own experience. I would say if there's no one for you to talk to when you start to encounter behavior that makes you feel a way, you know, that way you feel in your gut, your stomach, you know, something's off, something's wrong, you're not comfortable, email yourself and, and start to notice if your sixth email is way more off than your first email, because part of what's happening with, you know, predatory behavior is they're grooming you, they're breaking you down. So constantly compare the email you're sending to the email you sent the first time. And then try to find somebody that you can forward all those emails to at some point. So you don't have to re-traumatize yourself maybe by telling the story, but if you can find somebody you trust to share it with, who can maybe speak up for you or at least help you come up with a way to manage the situation, at least until you can maybe change the situation. But, you know, that's sort of like, the worst case scenario, if you're stuck, if you're in this culture, but I hope we can change the culture. And I think that's part of what this conversation is about. And I thank you for giving me the space to, to talk about this because I do think it is about men also being in the room and maybe seeing a woman who feels uncomfortable when the quote unquote locker room talk happens and the jokes happen and you look at her body language and you look at her face as she tries to laugh it off and play it off. You know, I would encourage every man to wonder if she's encountering that in front of you in this room and laughing it off. What do you think she's encountering when you're not in the room? When it's maybe just the guy who told the joke, maybe he goes further than a joke when he's with her alone. And maybe you should try to find a way to establish a rapport with her that gives her a safe space. There were men there that I worked with. You know, there was a lawyer named Frank Cooper who went on to be, I think, like the head of Pepsi or some huge deal. And he knew that I was a hard worker. He worked with me in all the agreements for the show soundtrack. You know, I wish he found a way to be more more of an ally, maybe. It's women, too, who feel like in order to ensure their proximity to male power, they play along. And so in order for somebody like Russell to go on and on and on as a violent predator, or for someone like L.A. Reid to go on and on and on as a sexual harasser, the good guys have to sort of sit around and watch that system It's sort of like we're taking on systemic racism. We're not just talking about people who hurt our feelings. We're talking about the systemic racism and we need white allies to be a part of dismantling the systemic racism. We need men to be a part of dismantling the systemic misogyny that creates these webs that catch woman after woman after woman. If you see the 
little stuff, the quote unquote, little superficial stuff happening. I promise you worse stuff is happening when you're not around, but by you countenancing and playing along and turning a blind eye to the soft violations, you're sending a signal to that woman. There's nobody in this environment who cares. There's nobody in this room that I can look to when it gets worse, when I'm alone with this person at the the studio or, you know, I'm in his car getting a ride to a listening session. And now we're in the back seat because he wanted to play me something on the way to the listening session or on the way to this industry event. And now I'm alone with him. You know, there was all this other stuff that happened when I wasn't alone that gave me the impression that all of this is okay. And I just have to deal with it. And that's what we have to change. That's what the good guys can help to change. I, I, I hear you in loud and clear. And I hope and part of the reason why um, we're having this discussion is when we put it out, I hope the audience hears you loud and clear. I think it's very important for, for um, people to hear and, and especially allies, right? Like if you think you're an ally, um, great. Continue to look in the mirror and say, am, am I good enough? Am I, am I doing everything that I can? Because um, this is a long fight. This has been going on for a very long time. And, and it's, one documentary is not going to change it. One interview is not going to change it. One allegation is it, it, consistent work every day to be our better selves. Um, lastly, you're back in music again, though, right? Like you found your passion for music. You, you signed the artist Ella Wild. Ella Wild, yes. I love her. She found me because actually her mom read the New York Times article. Her mom was my kid's preschool teacher. And she read the New York Times article and called me and asked me if I would give Ella some advice. And I took the meeting as a courtesy to her mom because her mom was like my kid's preschool teacher and I loved her mom. But I was kind of like, I don't think this is a great idea because one, I'm now like completely toxic in the music industry. Like if I wasn't already toxic and like dead in the water, which I was, now I'm like radioactive. And I don't think I can really help your daughter. But I also sort of just didn't want to open up that part of myself. And I thought, okay, I'll just take the meeting to be nice and she probably won't be very good. And I'll give her some advice and I can like get back to like my life, whatever my life is without making music. And then she's amazing. She writes beautifully. Like she writes like hits, like without even trying, like her composition is unbelievable. She's got the song medicine that she literally played for me the first time in the documentary is the first time I ever heard it that we just recorded with DJ Khalil. who's a Grammy winning producer. He's in that's, that's the homie. He, he's amazing. What up, Khalil? Ah, uh, that's my cousin too. Really? Which is basically how I'm able to be down at this point. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Shout out to Self Scientific. I saw, yes. I saw his daughter just uh, celebrated a birthday yesterday. Yes. Man. Shout out to Khalil, man. Yes. Love, man. yes. And the truth That's is, it. I'm so many people in the industry have blackballed me that I really wouldn't have known where to turn. There's like a small little universe of people that will even take my phone call. And I'm so blessed that my cousin is one of them and he is dope. So I'm just very fortunate there. Any support I can get, I appreciate, you know, anybody, you know, that is interested can find it on iTunes and Spotify and please buy it and support. I'm trying to raise money for my label. And I'm also trying to do for Ella what no one really did for me as a young Black woman is just to block and tackle for her and to create space for her to find her power and her audience and her voice and success as an artist without having to encounter the stuff that I encountered. I'm trying to be a champion for great music and great artists and to create a safe space for artists. And so that's what the ninth floor is all about. That was my safe space. So I'm trying to create a safe space, you know, and sort of pay it forward. I love it. I love, I love, First of all, let me thank you for just coming on and sharing your story. I can't imagine that it's easy to to relive, you know, through the documentary, through the various interviews. Um, so I appreciate you for that. Um, I appreciate you for talking to me about music as well. 
Like again, I I I noticed the tone shifts in our conversation, and every time you talked about the music that you work on, the way you just light up, um, is something that I could really relate to, and I, I love to see that light, and I love to hear that you're back in the game with Ninth Floor and Ella Wild, and 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 you know you're getting in touch with your passion again, and you know I, I wish you luck, and and I, I thank you for the conversation, and I thank you for your story and your perspective. Thank you for having me, and thank you for being an ally for women in this game. And thank you all for watching. Again, this was a very important episode of, of For the Record. Um, sometimes you see your favorite artists on here. We have fun. We joke. We laugh. We break down music. But none of that music is important if the people who create it aren't in a safe, healthy environment. So please watch this episode. Please share this episode. Please talk amongst your friends. And let's ha make this a community conversation about how we can all be better and, and, and really elevate that this thing that we love. Um, and I thank y'all for watching, man. This is For the Record. Peace.